in 10. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the International Gathering at Beth Rafa on this, the Lord's Day. We are still celebrating 20 years, our 20th anniversary celebration this morning, and we'll be closing out this evening. We're excited. We have been enjoying ourselves all week long, and we want to welcome all of you on all social media platforms this morning. Thank you for coming in and rather tuning in. And, we, and for those of you who are, I should say, streaming in, and for those of you who are who have joined us in the Zoom room, Remember, we're using the fellowship link all day today. If you're interested in coming, the information is on the screen uh, to be able to come on in. The information, the email information is on the screen on, on social media platform. If you would like to come into the Zoom room and join us this morning, we're going to prepare our hearts and minds for the men to cover us in prayer at this time. Our theme scripture, Joel chapter 2 verses 25 to 27 we are a restored generation and we are celebrating good morning once again we welcome you to our morning service and our 20th anniversary it is our custom in beth rafa for the men to please reach out your hands towards your devices as a posture of covering as we go to the lord in prayer this is the day that the lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it Lord, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your compassion and your love. We thank you, O oh God, for your Holy Spirit being present in this service. We thank you, O oh God, for just keeping the church door open for 20 years. You have been with us and you continue to be with us. We thank you, O oh God, for the praise and worship leaders. We pray that you would anoint them afresh so that they can lead us into worship. We pray, oh God, that you would fill our cups. We come empty this morning, asking you to fill us up, oh God. Fill us with your anointing. Fill us with your word. Fill us with repentance, oh God, so that we can be a restored generation. We thank you, oh God, for our bishop. We pray that you would continue to strengthen her and encourage her. We thank you for the media, oh God. We rebuke anything that would come to interrupt the services. We pray that you would allow things to flow easily. We thank you for the speaker today, oh God, that you would anoint them afresh, that the word would go forth and would bring about healing to your people so that we may be edified and you may be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much thank you so much again we do say we are excited about 20 years 20 years this is our celebration of 20 years we do honor the holy spirit and we welcome the presence of the lord where two or three are gathered he is here in our midst we salute our bishop this morning we say god bless you bishop yes amen that's right and we also want to salute all ordained clergy, all the new clergy in the house. That's right. You all ordained personnel, all consecrated personnel, and all those who are being elevated. We salute you even on this, the Lord's Day, first Sunday, where we're remembering our Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us. Amen. So just, again, make sure you're muted so that you can just freely celebrate with us this day, 20 years. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. Thank you, Lord. Aren't you glad he did that? Amen. So even though we're celebrating 20 years, we are celebrating his sacrifice as well on this, his day, on the first Sunday of November. Amen. team my hope is in the lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin and calvary for me for me for me he died he died for me 
Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant us, we beseech thee, that having this hope, we may purify ourselves even as he is pure, that when he shall appear again, with power and great glory, we may be made like unto him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, he liveth and reigneth ever, one God, world without end. Amen. Good morning. I will be reading in your hearing our Old Testament reading for instruction which will come from Psalm 146, verses one through nine. That is again, our Old Testament reading for instruction coming from Psalm 146, one through nine. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Psalm 146, one through nine. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, 
he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the, father, the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. So far the scripture, please turn with me to the gospel of St. Mark as we read our New Testament reading for admonition, which will come from St. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. We will read responsibly. I will read verse 38. And while on mute, we will read verse 39. And we will conclude at verse 44 together. Again, that is our New Testament reading for admonition coming from the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. And the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts. Which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. Together, for all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So far, the scripture. As you remain muted, let us confess together the declaration of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. It will appear on the screen. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When we say one Catholic and apostolic church, we are not only referring to the Roman Catholic Church, but the church universal. And by one baptism for the remission of sins, we mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when we say he descended into hell, we mean he went into the grave. For more information on the creeds, please refer to our website, BethRafa.org, under the heading, Why We Do the Things We Do. Amen. You know, in this 20 year, time, I can truly say that the Lord has been good to me. In this pandemic, I can truly say the Lord has been good to me. The scriptures tell us to be anxious for nothing. And this season has been one where people are so anxious. But I can truly say if you trust in the Lord, you can have that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
that will keep your heart and your mind. Come on and testify with us this morning how good the Lord has been. We don't always understand, but we know that he's good. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Lord, you are good. Simple song, very easy to pick up. Thank you, Lord. Praise team. Lord, you are good. You've been so good. Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Even if I try, cause you've been so good, so good. You've been, you've been so good, so good. You've been, you've been so good, so good. To me, to me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you are good.
Father, in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You can be determined today to go all the way with the Lord. That's it. Just keep moving forward. Thank you, Lord. Come on, sing it with us. If this is your declaration.
your name, Father. We just want to say thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify your name today, Father. God, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we are so grateful to know that you breathe the breath of life into our nostrils this morning. And God, before I even make my petition known before you, God, I ask that you will forgive me of my sins, the ones I've committed by word, thought, and deed, oh God. Oh Lord, and I thank you because your word says that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thus, we come boldly to your throne this morning, God. And Lord, we bring before you, first of all, God, we bring to you our bishop, Bishop Jacqueline Uli McCullough, Lord, we are blessed generation. We are blessed people, God, because you placed on the earth, oh God. You, oh God, Lord God, brought it at a time such as this, oh God, to bring deliverance to the heart of your people, Father. Lord, I want to ask that you would remember her. Father God, I pray that you will go into her home this morning, Father, and touch her from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet. Oh God, there's a prayer request in her bosom right now that we know not about, but you know about it, oh God. And Lord, I thank you right now that you're sitting in heaven, oh God, and you hear every word that comes out of her mouth and you see every tear that comes down her eyes. And Lord, your word says that you collect her tears in your own bottle and you take note in your own book. And so Father, I thank you right now for the heart of our bishop and for the heart that she has towards people and towards souls, oh God. And just like wisdom, oh God, like Solomon who asked for wisdom, oh God, Lord, he, she needs wisdom and what wisdom? To lead your people, Father. No, she knows that it's not her people, it's your people. So Father, we thank you for giving her wisdom to lead us, oh God, in a path of righteousness. And so God, we ask that you bless her financially, Lord God. Lord God, you are her portion this morning, Father. Lord, she will lack no good thing, oh God. And we thank you that every need is met, Father. The rent, the mortgage, oh God. Ah, the office, oh God, the building, oh God. We thank you that everything concerning her is in your hands and you're taking care of it. You said that you would lead her, oh God, and you would guide her and you would uphold her with, the, with your right hand of righteousness. And so I want to say thank you. And Lord, I don't only want to lift up Bishop McCullough. I want to lift up Overseer Robin Edwards and Pastor George Hyman, all of our pastors, oh God, the newly licensed and ordained ones, oh God, and the ones who were here before. Thank you. Thank you for giving us pastors after your own heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving Bishop McCullough the vision, oh God, and the wisdom on who to select, oh God, and anoint and smock, oh God. And I thank you that they have a yes in their belly to go all the way. And so, God, we thank you for the, the license and the new ordained ministers and, oh God, the, the missionaries, oh God. We want to say thank you, Lord. And so, God, we ask that you remember them. Lord, we bring the sick and the shut in before you, oh God. Lord, there are many sick among us, oh God, some we know of and some we do not. But those that we know about, Father God, we call uh, Junie Harris, oh God, before you, Lord. We call, Lord God, a uh, Jane King husband, Jonathan Cain, before you, Lord God. Lord, there are many people that their bodies are weakened with cancer, oh God. But your word said that nothing is too hard for you, Lord God. And so, Father, we know that you said, behold, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And God, we know already that nothing is too hard for you. Cancer is not too hard. Tumors in the body is not too hard, Lord God. Brain aneurysms are not too hard from you. Depression is not too hard for you. So God, we come to you, the God who is not too hard for. Hallelujah. With man, it is impossible, but with you, all things are possible. So God, we come for you because your word cannot lie. Your word says that healing is the children's bread. Now, if you didn't say it, Lord God, we know we're in trouble, but you said it. And your word says that you're not a man that you should lie. Neither the son of a man that you should repent. If you spoke it, you will make it good. So God, I'm thanking you today, Father, that all we have is your word to lean on today, Father. I want to thank you for all the pastors that came by, the bishops that came by to bring a word to the souls of your people to take us to our next journey, oh God. Lord, I pray that you remember, oh God, uh, uh, Bishop Page, oh God, remember his church family and his home, Lord God. Remember, Lord God, Bishop Woodson, oh God. Remember his wife and children at home. Remember, Lord God, Roger, Bishop Roger Caesar, oh God. Remember, oh God, Bishop Ju uh, uh, Julia, Lord God, this morning. Father, all those, Pastor Lashley, all of them are in tonight. We're not even there yet. But if you so see fit to bring us to tonight, Lord God, bless Pastor Samuel, Lord God. Send forth the anointing that will make preaching easier, God. Send forth the anointing that will open up our hearts, oh God. The anointing that will break the burdens, oh God. Break the yokes and the burdens off the back of your people. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. And God, I just want to say thank you. 
for our loved ones who are not saved. Father God, we lift up the loved one, every last loved one that's not saved. We call them out today, Father God, and we know that you're knocking at the door of their heart. We claim salvation for them today, Father. And Lord, I want to give a praise report. Thank you for bringing Pastor Dana home. The devil meant it for evil, but you also meant it to show the devil that he has no power over her body, over her pressure. You are the one that regulates that pressure, Father God. And I thank you right now for Pastor George, oh God. Cover him and his family in, 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 in Carolinas, oh God. Why they're burying their father. Cover Reverend Wanda when she travels, oh God. Give them traveling mercy. Cover uh, Reverend Jackson in the area of his mother leaving here, Lord God. And now you're comforting him and you're the mother, you're the mother and the father for him, Lord God. Even remember right now, Lord God, all those under the sound of my voice who lost a mother, a father, a brother, or a sister, keep them comforted. You are the God of mercies. You are the God of all comfort. We thank you for this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Welcome to Beth Rafa. Welcome to our season of celebration. We give thanks and praise to Almighty God for preserving and sustaining the international gathering at Beth Rafa and Headquarter Church for the Rafa Alliance for 20 prosperous years. Prosperous because the Lord has guided us continually and has blessed us like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And now has he called us a restored generation, which means that we have been raised up in an extraordinary manner and we shall build from the ruins of the pandemic and men shall call us repairers of breaches and paths to dwell in. And we shall be restorers of all that has fallen into decay and raise up the foundations of many generations such as shall continue for generations to come. We shall restore the pure doctrine and teachings of the word of God, which has been lost in the life of the covenant community. Thank you for joining this holy convocation and 20th anniversary celebration. Welcome to Beth Rafa, where you can experience healing to heal by loving Christ. Traditions come and go. This generation doesn't know the things of yesteryear and how life was defined some 30 odd years ago. Our communities were a village and Aunt Grace and Uncle Joe, they could discipline if you misbehave and you dare not stand in their face to have the last say. People loved genuinely and wanted to see the best for you. In the communities, they would stand proud and boast on the children there and proclaim whose child made it to college and how so-and-so son or daughter was going to an HSBCU. Those were the days that grandparents were true. They taught you words of wisdom and domestic chores too. They took us to church and Sunday school so we could know God for ourselves and have a relationship with him as well. And in the time of trouble, we would know how to pray. Prayer at noonday was big on the list and the reverence for God never went amiss. What happened to our children? Well, they took prayer out of the schools. Drugs became rampant and parents started acting the fool. Kids were taught not to respect anyone or even follow the rules. And the village became quiet in the rearing of our kids because then the mantra was, you better not say nothing to my kid. Some churches lost their witness because they were in the season of name and claim, money on their minds and salvation in the second lane. Grandparents were tired, but they had to raise the grandkids because sin and debauchery, their parents couldn't resist. Because of this climate, death knocked at some's door, 
prison awaited, and so much more. Some children were left wandering to raise themselves. A generation we feel was lost with nothing else. Nothing else to draw from but this world's wicked ways. So far from God, this generation had strayed. Oh, but some had praying grandmothers that prayed heaven down and they lived on stored up prayers where grace abounds. Prayers that flowed through their bodies like a lightning bolt on a thunderous day. The power of God is matchless and is worthy to be praised. And his word will never return void in all of the days. So it may seem as if this generation is wandering afar, but perhaps it's the way you look at God. If you look at him like he's an average man, you won't get very far. But if you recognize that he is the king of kings and that he holds the whole world in his hands and on the cross he died for you and me, and then you will know. This generation isn't lost. They just need help to find their way. Elders need to stand in the gap and pray and lead the way. The way to truth and grace so they can be free to bask in the love that God has for you and me. And then this generation will know as the songwriter sings, there's a mighty reformation sweeping o'er the land. God is gathering his people with his mighty hand. And when the cloudy day has ended and the evening sun is bright, with a shout of joy, we'll hail the light. And another song says, and we shall tell it to generations following. And we shall tell it to generations following that this God is our God, is our God forever, forever and ever, forever and ever. He will be our God to a generation restored. God bless you. Happy anniversary. Yours in his service, Cheryl Mayshack. Beth Rotham, what a blessed time we've had this week during our 20th year anniversary and holy convocation. Our souls have truly been uplifted and revived. To culminate our services today at our 7.30 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. services, Bishop Julia McMillan of New Dawn Restoration Center in Tampa, Florida. And this evening at 6.30 p.m., Pastor Stephen Samuel from Westbury Gospel Tabernacle in Westbury, New York. We look forward to seeing you there. Family, Rafa Alliance, Friends of Beth Rafa, the time of celebration is here. Beth Rafa is 20 years old. To commemorate this special occasion, we will be featuring Beth Rafa's 20th anniversary souvenir journal, which will chronicle our notable history from the time of inception of our ministry, all the way leading up to our 21st anniversary in November of 2022. As Beth Rafa remembers, this souvenir journal will include special tributes to Beth Rafa's foundational members and our fallen brothers and sisters who were soldiers in the army of the Lord. It will also include highlights of our 20th anniversary, Holy Convocation and Ordination Service. We encourage your participation and contribution to this historic initiative by submitting your well wishes, prayers, and congratulatory messages to our Bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. Jacqueline E. McCullough, and the International Gathering at Beth Rafa, as well as your loved ones and friends being elevated in ministry on November 6, 2021. Finally, Beth Rafa's 20th anniversary souvenir journal will be a testament of how we, 
As a community and ministry, we're impacted by the unprecedented season of COVID-19 that raged throughout the world and how the Lord is moving in our midst to strategically position us to be the embodiment of a restored generation. For more information, please visit our website at www.bethrafa.org or send email inquiries to journal at bethrafa.org. We look forward to your participation in this momentous emblem that gives an account of the life of the international gathering at Beth Rafa. Psalm 117, one through two declares, O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Beth Rafa family and friends, Please join us on Wednesday, November 24th at 8 p.m. as we gather together in a night of worship, praise, and fellowship, giving thanks to our God for all his blessings. Please mark your calendars and we will see you there. We are delighted so many of you have registered for classes in the BRCC fall quarter now underway. We are especially excited about our new Basic Hebrew One class taught by Professor Andre Mira of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Over 25 students are currently enrolled and committed to the journey of learning and mastering the Hebrew language. In addition to this amazing experience, we'd like to give you a peek of what's to come during the winter quarter here at Beth Rafa Christian College and Theological Seminary Incorporated. Along with over 100 online classes taught by our extraordinary faculty at BRCC, we are looking forward to welcoming two additional renowned professors to our team beginning in January 2022, Dr. Liston Page Jr. and Dr. Craig Keener. Dr. Liston Page Jr. has a long and distinguished career in teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is a lifelong student of the Word of God, having received his Doctor of Ministry and Master of Sacred Theology from Drew University, a Master of Divinity from Virginia Union University, and a Master of Theological Studies and Bachelors of Theology from Apostolic Christian College and Graduate School, respectively. We are grateful he has agreed to come on board with us and share his vast knowledge of biblical studies with our student body. In our winter 2022 quarter, he will be teaching a course entitled The History of Pentecostalism and Its Identity in the 21st Century. In addition, we are certainly honored and humbled to welcome Dr. Craig Keener to our team. He is a renowned scholar of the New Testament and has authored several commentaries and books currently used in seminaries and Bible colleges across this land. To name a few, the IVP Bible Background Commentary New Testament, Miracles, The Credibility of the New Testament Accounts, and Christobiography, Memory, History, and the Reliability of the Gospels. There are many more renowned works by Dr. Keener you will want to add to your library. He will begin his work with us in the Gospels with a course entitled, Common Challenges for the Christian, Key Passages in the Gospel of Mark. Stay tuned for more details regarding courses, required textbooks, instructional materials, and registration requirements. Begin preparing your hearts now to experience these awesome opportunities from such renowned professors of God's holy word. Blessings, Dr. Trish McLeod. Grace to you, Beth Rafa, and especially to our listening audience. We are excited about celebrating 20 years of ministry. Yes, Beth Rafa is turning 20 years old in November, and we want those of you who join us online on various social media platforms to share and participate in our celebration. This celebration is all about the proclamation and advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For 20 years, Beth Rafa has faithfully plowed the truth of God's holy word. We've done it locally and globally with compassion and zeal, and it has been by God's grace and your financial sowing into this ministry that we are still actively engaged in the furtherance of the gospel. 
One of the main principles of the kingdom of God and kingdom work is sowing and reaping. Jesus tells us that sowing and reaping is the very platform by which all of the principles of the kingdom work. When we consider the time that we are living in and the many churches that have been impacted by the pandemic and shut down or closed their doors and ceased from doing ministry, we are humbled and give praise and honor to God for keeping Beth Rapha alive. We know that the favor of God is upon our ministry. We can assert that when you give to this ministry, you are sowing into good ground. Therefore, we invite you to join us in this special season of celebration offering. You can give 20 cents, $20, $22, $200, $220, $2,000. Give in increments of 20 in the spirit of honoring our 20 years in ministry. And for those of you who are unable to give, we ask that you commit to praying for us. For we are a restored generation and we are committed to spreading the gospel and healing to heal by loving Christ. Thank you for your generosity. May God bless you richly. These have been your announcements. Any additional announcements will come from our bishop. And put your hands together. It's offering time in the sanctuary. Well, praise the Lord and a good morning to you, Beth Rafa. Happy anniversary to you, to the uh, ordained personnel, including those that were folded into the core yesterday. God bless you. Um, and also to those who are friends and family here in the Zoom room. If you're part of Rafa Alliance, happy convocation to you and to those who are on streaming. God bless you. It is my privilege to bring the offering exhortation for the month of November, and we will be going over love and hospitality, a biblical encouragement to give. By the way, did I say hi to Bishop McCullough? I'm sorry. How you doing? <laughs> Overseer, God bless you, and to um, Pastor George as well. So yes, love and hospitality is our theme for this month, and so let's just get going. Uh, in our season of celebration, we're incorporating this because we believe that in the first century church, hospitality and care for each other was preeminent. After the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, there was an attitude that no one will go without something that they needed for life and for the quality of their life to be what it had to be at that time. And so we're going to carry that forth into our season of celebration as a ministry. Uh, our text comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are in the body. So here, here we have, uh, so far the scripture, here we have in this uh, letter who we don't quite know who wrote it. Some say Paul, but others just say anonymous, it's unattributed. This particular writer was writing to Christians of the Jewish persuasion who were um, actually not facing, well, rather facing persecution at that time, okay? And here he says, though you might be facing persecution and you are scattered, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Why? Because you could be entertaining angels unawares. So let's look at what does brotherly love mean. Primarily in the New Testament, when it speaks of brotherly love, is that Greek word Philadelphia. Some of us know it as a city in the United States, uh, but it's actually a Greek word in the Bible that describes the love of Christians to one another. Brotherly love out of a common spiritual life. Because you and I have the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have the enabling of the Holy Ghost to show affection one to another and to have a concern about whether or not uh, we have needs. So Jesus says it like this. If somebody asks for your tunic or your coat, give them your tunic. And if they ask for your tunic, give them your coat. If somebody says to you, go one mile with me, he said, go with them two, double up, prefer them. 
see what their needs are and give to them on top of. That is a case of brotherly love. He says in his text, to let that be ongoing. Why? Let that be known as our lifestyle, just the way we do life, the way we do living, the way we live out our faith amongst each other and in the world. Let brotherly love continue. And don't neglect to entertain strangers. Now, strangers there uh, don't really mean people who are outside of the body of Christ. When you look at that word strangers, it will inform you that it means me and you again. So why, why talk about strangers? Well, because a lot of us don't really know each other, right? I mean, we're one in the body of Christ, absolutely. Um, and we have a tendency as human beings to give to people who we're familiar with, who we, who we know something about. I might know your situation and want to put $10 in your hand. But there are other believers who you don't know who you should put $10 in their hand or say it this way. There are believers whose situations you have no idea. They could be dressed to the nines. They could look really awesome and good and could probably have no food in their cupboards. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to entertain strangers because they could be angels without you knowing hospitality is the word that says show love to them. So it's not just, um, hmm. it's not just, I've got nothing but love for you. <laughs> I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate that I see you, that I care about you, that I want it to be well with you, not just in the spirit, we have that in common, but in your natural state, with your material things, and you'll see that was the case in Acts chapters one, two, three, and four, maybe even five, as you read the beginning of the start of the church and how they um, sold their goods and gave their profits and put it at the apostles' feet so that they could distribute to each as they would. They did not neglect to entertain strangers. Strangers were not um, new, a new concept. When Israel was, what, delivered from Egypt, the Bible says that a mixed multitude went with them, not just the children of Israel, but Egyptians along and some other people along the way probably joined the band. Entertaining strangers, we see it in Genesis. In one of my Bible readings this morning was when um, two men came to Abraham and he served them. He washed their feet and he had Sarai make them a meal. He entertained strangers. Lot was about to entertain strangers, even though they were beating at their door. He said, hey, listen, come on in. Come on in, hurry up before the people in the city get to you. I'll offer them my daughters, but Lot knew how to entertain strangers. And then how does Jesus say entertaining strangers? Look, you'll find that in Matthew 25, 35 to 40, and I will not read it for you in this service, but I did read it in the last service, and I encourage you to read it on your own when you get a chance, and you will see that Jesus says, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, did what? Gave them food, gave them clothes, visited them in prison, took care of them, saw their needs, and met it. He said, as, as much as you've done to them, you've done it also unto me. And I believe that's what the Lord is saying to you and me this morning. Let's be careful to see. Let's be careful to meet needs. Let's be careful to show, to show love to people we don't know in the body and out of the body because we're empowered to do it. That is how the Lord, when, when um, Diane read, uh, Pastor Diane read Psalm 148 this morning, it said, God is concerned about the poor. God is concerned about the needy. And he meets their needs through you and through me. Love and hospitality. Bishop? Put your hands together. This is something we ought to look forward to for this whole month. And it came at such a good time because you have Thanksgiving coming up and you have Christmas coming up. And things are getting very funny right now because, you know, food prices have gone up and they, we, we're, on, we're on the brink of a recession, inflation, whatever. So money and food will get funny. And when that happens, we start hoarding. We start holding back for our own families. But I'm a living witness agreeing with the word of God that when you give, it shall give back to you. I just want to thank God for those of you who opened your homes on yesterday. You see, the elevation service could not gather in one place. It gathered in people's homes where the first church started. Do you remember that? The first church started in the homes. 
and people gathered in homes and ministered to each other. And guess what happened afterwards? They had dinner together. I want to, and my heart was so rejoicing because many of you, you know, many, many of you opened your homes and invited people over. Some of them were elevated and, you know, safely, safely, you know, because we're still in COVID. And we thank God because it was just such an example of the original intent. And they went from house to house, breaking bread and having fellowship. That's what makes a community strong. Hospitality, giving, you know what I'm saying? And, and not just sharing. And it's not with your BFF either. You know, you, you, your best friend. It's with for people that you don't even ordinarily fellowship with. I think it's so wonderful. It makes people feel like they belong. And one more thing I'd like to add from this, this wonderful um, exhortation at this, at this season, at this time, Thanksgiving is coming and you may not be able to gather, but you can find ways, you know, um, you, you, can, you can do a meal on wheel with your car. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Yes, you can drop off food. You can put a, a nice bag at the door. You don't have to make a big announcement. You can, you can do so many interesting things to people. You can cash app them, you know, and, and let them go out and buy what they need. Just put a little piece in your budget. And every time I give money out of my means to somebody, somebody sends it back to me. It, it, it's a matter of seconds or minutes. It's amazing. So I listen to the concept. I'm giving you a hundred dollars and immediately brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so gives me a hundred. Do you know that that blessing is not only for me now, it's for brother so-and-so because he trusted me to use it. So it ricochets back to him. You understand? Keeping it in the community as Pastor Brian was talking about. That brother really, I was a conduit of his hundred and somebody was a conduit of his Oh my God. So it, it, so my blessing is here and his blessing is there also. It's just wonderful, this thing about hospitality. But I want, you know, Reverend Katrina stirred me up. I'm sorry, I won't be long because I know you all think I'm long-winded. But let me do this in 30 seconds. Do you know that many of you here for 20 years didn't know that you would be where you are in terms of ministry? in terms of elevation and it took love and hospitality to see you beyond your faults your weaknesses your fears and obey god and says this person may not be producing right right now they are a blister on the heel of progress i mean a big old fat blister right there and the lord said blister today but they will not be a blister to my, listen, it takes hospitality and love to do that. Somebody said, get rid of them, get rid of them. They're a pain in the, because blisters hurt, you know, you ever, you ever walk in your shoe and there's a blister on your heel and you have to walk, huh? That's not easy. That's an irritation. You want to cut off your heel, whatever. But the Lord said, no, no, no. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen. Because what you're looking at today is not what I see for tomorrow. Oh, come on. Let's go beyond. Let's come out the box, you all. Listen, it's, it's feeding the body, but it's also encouraging the spirit. God bless you. God bless you. You know, it, it, we, what, what, what I am today is not what I was 30 years ago. Somebody said, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I say the same thing too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I, listen to me. I asked some people who dealt with me a couple of years ago. It wasn't pretty. Not that I'm pretty now, but I just, I got better looking along the way. All right, let's give us unto the Lord. Let's give us unto the Lord. Let's give to him who is a blesser of every good gift. Every good gift comes from him. So give as if you've got something good from the Lord. Amen. And give an anniversary gift. Here, here's the information in Jesus name. Give as directed by the Holy Ghost. Lord, the people. 
that we give all the glory and all the honor and all the praise to because he deserves it, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just say this to you. I thank God for friends and I thank God for family. Amen. I do. I thank, I've got some good friends. I don't have a lot of, lot of good, good friends. I mean, I have a lot of acquaintances and friends and but I have a few good, 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 good friends, amen, that I can call and they'll be there for me in so many different ways. But I thank God for them. But who do I thank for them? God. In other words, you're not ignoring your friends or your family, but you're putting him in his rightful place. All the glory belongs to him. So every time something happens to me or for me or with me, I said to God, be what? The glory. If you feel that way, just raise your hand this morning in the 20th anniversary to God be the glory. That's right, Pastor Chris, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So love ye the world that he gave us his son. Amen. And we're grateful this morning. So grateful, so grateful, so grateful. And I don't ever want to, um, I don't ever want to be an ingrate, you know, I have people who have been with me for 30 something, 40 years. And every time they do something for me, I say, thank you. And somebody says, you don't have to say thank you. I said, stop it. 
you want me to say thank you. Because if I don't say thank you, I will feel entitled. I will feel like I'm supposed to have it. I don't want to ever feel like that. I want to always know that it is the goodness of the Lord. It is the mercy of the Lord. So leave me and let me say thank you. Don't, let, don't interfere with my praise because I just want to give him glory. I want to go down not as a, a great preacher, but a great lover of God, a great, a great lover of his goodness, his righteousness. And even when he, you know, even when he, he chases me, it's a love chase. Yeah. Even when he corrects me and, you know, he corrects me very badly. Sometimes I feel so badly. I said, oh God, that's such a slap, but I love him anyhow. Amen. Thank the Lord. Put your hands together for the Lord's day. The Lord's day. I salute all of the, the executive pastors, all of the pastors, all of the pastors in training, the ones who are newly elevated from all the different churches. I honor the pastors from um, the, the Alliance. I will recognize you individually after the preachment because we're on the preacher's time. Amen. So we're going to have a sermonic solo by Sister Crystal Forrest and immediately following we thank God for Bishop Julian Macmillan, who is the senior pastor of New Dawn Restoration Center, along with her husband, overseer Terry Macmillan. And we thank God for her coming by again on our 20th year to share a word. And if it was like this morning, we need to sit up. Nobody don't sleep here. Don't act like you sleep here on this Zoom. You understand? Don't act, don't be pulling your window up and down and acting a little crazy. Sit straight up so you can hear the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Crystal Forrest and then the preacher. North Carolina is the devoted wife of 35 plus years to overseer Elder Terry S. McMillan. They are the proud parents of three children and three grandchildren. 
She is the founder and senior pastor of New Dawn Restoration Center in Tampa, Florida, where her vision is the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry through the deliverance, development, and deployment of those entrusted to her. On June 27, 2013, she was installed as overseer, and on June 28, 2019, she was consecrated as bishop in the Lord's Church by Bishop David M. Copeland, presiding prelate of the Kingdom Council of Independent Churches and Ministries. In 2009, she launched Dr. Julia and McMillan Ministries as a means of reaching, restoring, renewing, and reshaping the lives of Christians and non-Christians locally, nationally, and globally. Dr. McMillan is a dynamic preacher-teacher and speaks at conferences, conducts leadership development training for various churches, Bible institutes, universities, and other organizations, and facilitates ministerial training in ethics and order. Bishop McMillan holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in English and Communications from Virginia State University, an MBA from Florida Metropolitan University, a Master's of Religion, a Master's of Divinity, and a Doctorate of Ministry, each respectfully from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary. She is currently pursuing her PhD in Theology and Ethics in the Church from the Beth Rafa Christian College and Theological Seminary under the esteemed leadership of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough. Bishop McMillan currently serves as Professor of Organizational Ethics at Liberty University. She has authored the book, Prophetic Crack, Pushers in the Pulpit, Addicts in the Pews, one of the most prolific and provocative discourses on church membership, leadership, ethics, and integrity. On behalf of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, the International Gathering at Beth Rafa welcomes Bishop Julia McMillan of New Dawn Restoration Center in Tampa, Florida. Well, greetings, beloved. Grace and peace be unto you all from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To our esteemed Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough and the Beth Rafa family, congratulations to you on this celebration of 20 years of ministry to the Holy Convocation, the Rafa Alliance, to all of the pastors and all of those members that have been able to be with us in this virtual space. Congratulations to you all. I am so excited uh, that, uh, you know, it was, it was, it really pained me that I could not be in New York. It really did. But I am grateful that God has given us this virtual space and means to be connected yet. And so I'm just grateful. And as Bishop said on yesterday, I know it ain't over. And when we do come together, what a time we will have. But in the meantime, God has been good to us, sustaining us, keeping you and keeping us. And we are eternally, eternally grateful. Well, saints of God, as I said again this morning to our Bishop, Bishop, I thank you for the privilege of this opportunity again and again and again, because I recognize that it could have been another way. And I am just so grateful to stand uh, and divide the word of the Lord in this moment, in this hour, and in this very special celebration. Well, saints of God, let's move to the word of the Lord from our theme text, Joel chapter 2, verses 25 through 27. I'll read for your hearing from the, new, from the King James Version of the Bible. Here begins the reading of the word of the Lord. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Verse number 26, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Verse number 27. And ye shall know. And some versions say, then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So far, the scriptures. For the time that is mine in this uh, second service, pray with me this morning, saints of God, as we minister from this subject after the locust years. This is a call to obedience. After the locust years, a call 
to obedience. The prophet Joel warned the people of God's judgment in the imagery of the impending invasion of locusts. He called the people of Judah and Jerusalem to weep over their sins. He called them to fast and to repent because the day of the Lord is approaching. Soon the plague came and devastated the whole land and its effects were clearly seen and felt. The locusts came like a storm. They darkened the skies and every green thing was left barren. There was no hope of escape and they, and, and they left utter, utter decimation in their path. Joel seized upon the imagery of the locust as a type of the greater judgment that would come on the day of the Lord. In the last days, scripture says, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. The Lord gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. And for strong is the one who executes his word for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And the scripture says, who can endure it? Joel assures the victims of the devastating plague that if they would repent of their sins, returning to the covenant, the land would become refreshed. Productivity would return. The political threat would be averted and the years lost to the devastation will be restored. The prophet Ezekiel describes this restoration in Ezekiel 36 verses 24 through 27. He says, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you calls you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So far the scriptures. Saints of God, there is a longing, a longing for restoration throughout the Bible. The psalmist cried out in Psalm 6 and 3, how long, O Lord, until you restore me? David cried out in Psalm 51, and 12, restore to me the joy of my salvation and make me willing to obey you. In Psalm 119 and 107, the psalmist says, I've suffered much, O Lord. Restore my life again as you have promised. And the prophets, the prophets pleaded with God, turn me again to you and restore me for you alone are the Lord my God, Jeremiah 31 and 18. And then restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again, the writer of Lamentations. Paul named it even as a goal in 2 Corinthians 13 and 9. Paul says, your restoration is what we pray for. Saints of God, all who have been broken, shamed, or disgraced, understand both the need and the great blessing of restoration. And here's the good news. God is a God of restoration. Saints, I've been reflecting all week long on where I was when the Lord found me. I have been reflecting all week long, as Bishop said earlier, if I look back 30 years ago in my life, 20 years, maybe not even that far, I'm telling you the Lord has brought me from a mighty long way. I remember the saints of old saying that, but I never really knew what it meant. But when you've been uh, broken and in a state or condition, 
that was less than profitable to your soul and the Lord brings you out and brings you back. That's reason enough to give God praise even right here in this moment. God has been good to us. It's high time that we began to reflect back. Many of us have been saved so long, we forgot what we used to look like. And we forgot the goodness of the Lord. And here we are now standing as living witnesses in the land of the living because of the grace, but for the grace of God. There goes I, when we see those that are yet struggling with devastation and struggling with degradation and decimation, yet for the grace of God, there goes I. The good news is God is still a God of restoration. And as such, he promises that no matter our broken state or condition, he will restore. He will restore. Isaiah 57 and 18 says, I've seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore. I'm so grateful to the comforting God that we serve because if some of you may have seen me years ago, you wouldn't have wanted to touch that with a 10 foot pole. But he says, I've seen their ways, but I will yet heal them. I will guide them and restore. This is good news. Zechariah 10 and six confirms it and says, I will restore them because of my compassion. But his prerequisite saints of God, as we have heard all week is repentance. His prerequisite is repentance. Joel says in 2 and 12, he says, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all of your hearts, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. Yes, he is. He's slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Saints, the Greek word for repent is metanoia, and it means to be convinced of another way to change your mind or your convictions. And in response to being convinced in your mind and heart, change your actions. God was calling them to lay aside these weights that do so easily beset us and turn from going your way to going God's way. And as I share with people, the, a 360 will not do it. That's not what he's calling for. A 360 will put you right back where you were. He's calling for a 180, a complete turn in the opposite direction. Saints of God, repentance means to rearrange your entire way of thinking, feeling, and being in order to forsake that which is wrong. And, and, and if I could drop this off, Repentance has no shortcuts. Repentance has no, no shortcuts. Maybe not in New York, but some of the saints here like to take shortcuts. What do you mean, Bishop? They want to serve their way around it. Some want to give their way around it. They want to, as the old school, you say, cheese their way around it. But repentance has no shortcuts. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father, save by me. No, no shortcut, saints of God. Can I drop this off? You cannot gain in sacrifice what you lost in disobedience. You cannot gain in sacrifice what you lost in disobedience. There are no shortcuts. And this is why, this is why I was sharing with somebody earlier this morning that, that uh, we see uh, uh, the same saints come to the altar with the same problems because we're doing 360s and we're not doing 180s. There are no shortcuts, saints of God, after the suffering and shame, after the debilitating and destructive life of sin, after the embarrassment, after the degradation, and, and, and after true repentance, God does restore. Now, now notice here, just a little something I saw in the text. I'm going to lift it and I pray that it blesses you. Notice he's clear. The Bible says all about what he will do. I will restore you. Mm -hmm. He says, he says, he says, you will have plenty to eat. He says, he says, I'm going to remove all of this shame from you I, that, that I sent among you. You'll have plenty to eat. You're going to be full. You're going to be satisfied. 
He says, he says, he gives us, he's clear of what he will do. But then he's equally as clear of what the restored generation must do. And this is the focus of our conversation this afternoon. Our response. Once he restores, uh -huh, there's a shift from what he will do to what now we must do. Hallelujah. The land of Judah was a restored generation in, this, in, in verses 26 through 27. Removed from the days of the locust invasion. He says, I'm going I'm to take care of all of this. And here we are, many of us, far removed from our days of embarrassment, far removed from our drought seasons, far, many of us, far removed from our barrenness and ruin. And God is clear that there's an expectation for the restored generation. After the locust years, there is a call to obedience. Israel, saints of God, was God's special treasure and heritage. To Israel, God gave his laws, his covenant. To Israel, God gave the priesthood and the temple and special land and the promise that, that, that they would bless the whole world. Israel was called to bear witness to other nations that God was their one true God. They were special to God. This was a special treasure. They were a special treasure and heritage to God. And so how could God be glorified if his chosen people were destroyed and the pagans could mock them asking, where is their God? Israel had to make a decision. They had to choose between revival or reproach either get right with God or reproach the robbing him of his glory. And as members, saints of God, of God's royal priesthood, the restored generation, we must make that decision too. The most convincing manifestation of this great blessing of restoration is our repentance and our obedience to God's direction. Many remain lost here in Florida, because they are confused by the saints. Profess this loving God, profess his re restoration, res re confess that he loves, that he cares, that he brought us out, but yet find difficulty living from, for him day to day. One of the greatest manifestations is not what we say, but how we live. And so this is a call to obedience. This is a call. Now how that we've been restored and have made this choice to follow the Lord, obedience to his word, his will, and his way is expected. Saints of God, life after the locust years should be different. For what good would it have been? Would it be to have a restored land populated by sinful people? What good would it be to have a restored land populated by sinful people. Godly restoration, saints of God, is a call to obedience. Joel did not teach that God's punishment is for punishment's sake. Behind the warning is a call to repentance and ahead of the restoration is a call to obedience. Paul said it like this, he said, but now that you have been set free, from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life, Romans 6 and 22. So what then, Bishop, are the ex expectations of this now restored generation? The scriptures are clear. After the locust years, our lives should reflect, number one, unrestricted praise unrestricted praise. Looking at verse number 26 and 27 this afternoon. The Bible says, you will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Our, our bishop told us the other night, she said, if, if you don't like, you're not gonna like me if you don't like praise. After this is over, if you don't like praise, 
you, 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 you're you not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to want to be next to me. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be one of those talk to your neighbor uh, and the neighbor says, can you sit down, please? Can you uh, uh, do something else rather than opening up your mouth? It's not going to be one of those because we owe God in this season an unrestricted praise. Whether our trials have been of a temporal nature or whether heavy or of long continuous, whether extremely afflictive or whether they've caused unprecedented distress, the removal of them, whether they've been public, private, social or personal is a just ground for praise. When God permits us to behold his wonderful acts towards us, our response ought to be devout and fervent and should be in proportion to the occasion that brings them forth. Uh, uh, say that again, Bishop. Okay. When God permits us to behold his wonderful acts towards us, our response should be devout, it should be fervent, and it should be in proportion to the occasion that brings them forth. Well, well what are you saying here, Pastor McMillan? What I'm saying is this. I know what the Lord has brought me through. You don't know, like I know, what the Lord has done for me, but my praise should be commensurate with his mighty acts towards my life. Lord, have mercy. Does your praise reflect what the Lord has done? In this next season, saints of God, I don't believe that, uh, that uh, Pastor Dana or here in Florida, Pastor Tony or the many worship leaders across the country, I don't believe their work should be so hard. I, 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 I just don't believe it. After we come out of this, I just don't believe that folk ought to prod us and got to drag us into a place of praise or into the presence of the Lord. I don't believe it. Bishop, I'm reminded of a missions trip that I was on several years ago down in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and going into the worship center at four o'clock in the morning, looking at the hillside, Lord have mercy, and all you could see was grateful people running out of the hillside running out of the mountains, running out of some of the most deplorable conditions you could imagine, but grateful for the privilege of praise. And so I'm telling you, I believe that we're going to see a praise revival. And this is what the Bible is calling us to, unrestricted praise. Bishop, I love you. I'll stand right next to you because I'm going to be praising just like you. I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. God has been good to us. And the scriptures are telling us after the locust years, after the degradation, after the amount of pain, after the affliction, we ought to give God a praise that reflects what we've had to endure. Lord, have mercy. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for us, my soul begins to holler. Hallelujah. Thank God for saving us. Despicable as we may have been in his kindness, he restores us and he demands our praise. Nothing the Israelites did, nothing that they did or nothing that we have done warrants God's blessings upon them. And what Moses said to Israel is what God is saying to us. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter seven, verses seven and eight, the Lord did not choose you and lavish you, his love on you because you were larger or greater than any other nation. For you were the smallest of them all. The Bible says it was simply because the Lord loves you. Lord have mercy. Governments will fail, and but God's love will last. Crowns are temporary, but the love of God is eternal. Your money will run out, but his love never will. His love is unfailing, unconditional, and unlike our love, he is never fails. His love is immensely different from our own, even, even when we do find people that we like. Our feelings will fluctuate. How they treat us will affect how we love them, but not so with the love of God. We have no high thermostatic impact on his love for us. The love of God is born from within him, not from what he finds in us. There was no good, nothing warranted him blessing them like that. And when I think about my own life, nothing, nothing, nothing warranted what God has done in my life. Charles Wesley says, he hath loved us because he would love. Does he love us because of our goodness, because of our kindness, because of our obedience? No, he loves us because of his own. Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he 
loved us. And this is the grounds for praise. And then something I want to point out here. The, uh, so far and so for his great love, we're commanded to praise him. And he says, you will. I was fascinated by that. He says, you will praise me. He, he, he doesn't say, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to ask you. I'm going to have to teach you. I'm going to have to uh, do something else for you. No, he says, listen, listen, I'm going to restore you and you will praise me. Oh, I wish I could tell you to tell your neighbor, just tell yourself. God has a way of getting praise out of you. Hallelujah. We can sit like a knots on the log as the old folk would say all we want to, but God knows how to take you through to bring you out. And once you get out, God knows how to make you cause you to triumph. And once he causes us to triumph, he'll cause you to praise. He said, you will. You, you, you will. I promise you, you will. And here's why I believe. Why, Bishop? Because this time, somebody just holler, this time, ah, we're not going to be praising him for stuff. This time, when we come up out of this, we're not going to be praising him for fine home, fancy clothes and cars. We're not going to be praising him for the stuff. This time you will be different. And I, I kept reading. And he says, he says, you will praise, you will praise, you will. And then he says, you're going to praise the name of the Lord. Now, this ain't going to be Pastor Diane, one of them seasons where, where oh, the Lord bought me a new house. Oh, the Lord, those are good, they're wonderful. But that's the things that he adds after we seek ye first. So he says, he says, you will praise. Then he tells us what we're going to praise for. Uh, he, he said, you're going to praise the name of the Lord. That's what you're going to praise. Because this season right here is going to teach you that I'm just not the one who gives you things. I'm Elohim. You, you're going to learn me differently in this season. You, you're going to learn me as God, your creator, the mighty and strong one. You're going to praise my name. You're going you're gonna to know who I am. You're going to praise me as El Shaddai, the mighty one of Jacob, his, knowing his ultimate power huh, over all. Have you ever thought about why you're still here? 800,000 people are gone, but you're still here. Lord have mercy. Help me this afternoon. I feel God in here, but you're still here. Why? To give God praise. Not to sit and look at no preacher and think we're going to preach you happy. The choir going to sing you happy. The minister going to sing your favorite song. No, you're going to praise him because you now know him. You now know him as Elohim. You now know him ha, as Jehovah Jireh. You now know that when stores were shut down and people couldn't produce down here in Florida, much of the crop couldn't produce anymore, but God made a way. You're going to know him as Jireh. Know him, know him. You're going to know him as your banner, the Lord who watched over your house and the blood uh, uh, that was on the doorpost said, pass by that one, pass by that one. You're going to know him. You're going to know him as Jehovah Mekadesh, the one who has kept you quiet and sanctified you in this season. You're going to know me differently. You ain't going to praise me for stuff. You're going to praise my name. And the good news is I can't wait for the saints to get back together. He says, you will. You're going to do this. I remember my father. He said to us, he said, if I come to the school once, Take this to the bank. I will never come again. What are you saying, Bishop? Daddies know how to help you understand what you going to do. The Bible says you will praise me. Lord have mercy. I used to think, Bishop, this is just true. I used to think when I was growing up, Pastor Diane, I used to think, why the, why the mothers of the church, why they praise like they do? What? I used to say, I would never do that. I would never, never. They would shout till they were out of control. They would shout, just shout and tear up the churches. They would, just, but they love God. They came in with a praise. And I used to sit there when I was just getting to know the Lord at 16. I say, what, what are they doing now? He knows how to get a praise out of you. Lord, have mercy, God. I wish I had somebody just put your hands together and bless the name of our God, because if you were not a praiser before this, the Bible declares you will praise the name 
of the Lord. The Bible commands us to praise. Psalm number 150, if you ain't got no reasons, the Bible says praise him. God in the sanctuary, for in his mighty heavens, for his acts of power, for his surpassing high greatness, with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the heart and the light, everything. Praise him with timbrel and dancing, and with the string and the pipe, with the clashing of cymbals, and praise him with resounded. Let everything that has breath after this praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for he has done great things. Bible says, Bible says, praise him for the wonderful things that he has done. He has dealt marvelously with you, saints of God. We are commanded to praise the Lord. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised from the rising of the sun till the going down of the said saint. We are commanded to praise the Lord for he is worthy. Joel says, you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. This is going to be a season of recovered memory. This is going to be a season of recovered memory. We forget too fast what the Lord has done, mm -hmm. but we're going to be reminded, Jesus, I'll never forget what, you, what you've done for me. When we come out of this, Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget no, never, because we cherish life now. We, we cherish relationships now. We, we cherish one another now. We, 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 we cherish more. We don't take things for granted as much we shouldn't. We, 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 we know that it could be here today and gone tomorrow. But God has been good to us. He has dealt wondrously with us. And after the locust years, our lives should reflect unrestricted praise. Secondly, they ought to reflect unending fellowship. Unending fellowship. Verse number 27a says, then you will know that I am in Israel. Unending fellowship. The restored generation should enjoy continuous fellowship with God, pure and simple, pure and simple. Now the word then, then, uh, then out of the NIV version, he says, then you will know that I am the Lord, right? And so the word then is, is a conjunctive adverb denoting a time when what was, when what was will ignite what will be. Say, say that again, okay. The word then, is a conjunctive adverb, which denotes a time when what was will ignite what will be. Mm -hmm. it, it refers to after life. It refers to life after the rest restoration. It uh, based on what had occurred before. That's what are you saying? That after God healed your body, then. After, after, ha, ah, after God has regulated your mind, then, because you know, a lot of folks are losing their mind right now, Pastor Trish. A lot of folks, a lot, you're not, but a lot of folks are losing their minds right now. After I've regulated your mind, after I've restored your family, after I taught you how to love one another, I put you in the house together so you can learn one another all over again. After I taught you how to live together, how to be in community, after all of this, then, then you will know that I am God after I have restored the years that have been ravaged by the enemy and repaired every wounded place in your life. After I have mended the areas that have been battered by the winds of adversity so that your emotions could be healed and your soul could be restored. After I have destroyed the strongholds, old mindsets and memories that the enemy had placed in your thoughts. After I've secured the structures of your mind that have become warped and weakened. After saints of God, I uncovered your hidden agendas and made all things new and satisfied your desolate wasteland. Then you will know that I am in Israel. Never again 
Will you be disregarded and never again will you be forsaken for I am in Israel. Saints of God, his presence is the very foundation on which we are meant to live as his people. He's saying simply this, we were designed for more than the trivial pursuit of pleasure. We were designed for more than the trivial pursuit of pleasure because the hard truth is that we ain't never gonna find relief if we continue to seek it through possessions or through people. Seeking satisfaction in the, in the things of this world is like chasing the wind. Once, you, once you're finally exhausted and weary from the pursuit, you're left empty handed and disappointed, wasting valuable time chasing nothing. The problem is our hearts are like black holes of discontentment, devour, devouring relationships and possessions, all while screaming, I need more. I need more. We're always eating, but never famished. Always famished. We're always drinking, but never satisfied. Hey, God says it like this. He says, like having a purse that has holes in it. Never satisfied. And this dissatisfaction in life is near the root of all kinds of sin. One of the things that we've learned in the pandemic season is the things that used to satisfy us. He shut it down. Now what? We're in the presence of the Lord. Unending fellowship with him. His presence, saints of God, is what we're after. Because dissatisfaction is the root of some of is the in life is near the root of all kind of sin. Why do people cheat? Why do people cheat on their spouses or abuse drugs and alcohol or, or mindlessly binge uh -huh. or watch ridiculous amounts of television or scroll uh, endlessly on Facebook and Twitter? Why do they do these outlandish things? Because of discontentment, we are never satisfied. But his presence, saints of God, is the secret to abiding joy. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. John 15 and 11 says that my joy might be in you and that your joy may, may be made complete. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, the mighty one who will save, Zephaniah says in 317. He will rejoice over you with gladness, and he will quiet you by his love. Unending fellowship, saints of God, after turning back to God and realizing his everlasting love, the restored generation, life should reflect unending fellowship because we now know he's with us and he'll never, never, ever, ever leave us. The Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long, counted as sheep for the slaughter. But nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life or angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Unending fellowship. After the locust years, our lives should reflect unrestricted praise. They should reflect unending fellowship. Thirdly, they should reflect undivided allegiance. Undivided allegiance. 27b, the Bible says, but will you know that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other undivided allegiance. Saints of God, the ultimate aim, God sending the locust horde against his people was to secure their undivided allegiance. One of the main causes of the plague had been the people's half-hearted idol worshiping allegiance. Some of their affections had gone after other things other than God because he was not their all-consuming love. Few things, few things, are more dishonoring to God and dangerous for us than to love him half-heartedly. Few things. Mm -hmm. Exodus 20 verses two through six warns, ah, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and out of the hand of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Saints of God, there are, there are certain aspects of our relationship with God that are described in unmistakably legal terms. Uh-huh. 
while others are remarkably personal. For example, our justification is a legal term, a legal declaration of righteousness in the courtroom of God. Our adoption is a legal term, a legal declaration that we are indeed the children of God and thus entitled to all the benefits that belong to his children. Some are unmistakably legal, but others are remarkably personal. Thou shalt have no other gods before me is remarkably personal. Uh -huh. This is the expression of the first commandment flowing because flowing from these benefits are aspects of our relationship with God and they are tender and they are relational. He seeks our undivided allegiance. It's a sobering reality that Israel should enjoy a mixed relationship with God. It's a sobering reality that anybody would make God second in our life of priority after he's brought us out. It's a sobering reality. On the one hand, God brought them out of Egypt so that they might keep the very commands that he gave them. Beginning with the first one, thou shalt have no other God. At the same time, the sinfulness of their hearts was exposed by the very commandments that he gave them. The commands demanded not only a ritualistic obedience, but an obedience of the heart for God alone is worthy. As, as the choir saying this morning, you are the holy one. You are the one. You're the only one. And this is what God was calling us to after the locust years. We owe him. We owe him an unrestricted praise and unending fellowship and undivided allegiance. And um, later this month, later this month, my husband and I will celebrate 38 years of marriage, 38. And I, and I am so happy to say that during those 38 years, we vowed that nobody human would ever be placed in front of us to include our children. Our children joined us. That's just the way we, okay. They came, we were already, so our marriage did not fall apart when the children came, A amen. We vowed that we would be together and we would not ever, ever break our allegiance. In 38 years, that has been the case and had no problem with. So when we make a vow, we can keep a vow if we desire to keep a vow. And God says, no, you, I, I, I'm a, he told him, I'm jealous. I'm je you don't have to worry about how I'm gonna feel, how I'm gonna react, I'm telling you, I'm a jealous God. Some people don't find that out about their spouses and stuff. Bishop, after they get married, because they don't talk about that kind of stuff. They don't introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Dr. So-and-so and so and so and i am jealous. I'm very jealous. People just don't say that kind of stuff. It comes out, right? It's revealed at a certain time. Come on, somebody. You're walking in the mall. You don't know what's going on with him. You looked at somebody, said hello. They dropped a cup on the floor. You picked it up, and he got a problem. Come on, somebody. God didn't hold it back. He did not withhold that information. He said, I am a jealous God. You shall have no other gods before me. It don't get no planning in that. And so after the locust years, what is this call to obedience? It is a call to unrestricted praise. It is a call to unending fellowship. It is a call to undivided allegiance. And finally, it is a call to unchanging dignity. Unchanging dignity. Verse number 27c, never again shall my people be shamed. So after so great a devastation, God restores the land to fertility and declares that the shame for their actions had been repealed. He, he, he no longer will they have to be embarrassed or shamed by what they had done and how they lived or even how they had displeased God. No longer would they have to be ashamed for acknowledging their one true God and giving him all the glory. No longer would his name be in vain for this day, they're going to be revealed as the restored generation. Shame, saints of God, is this intense feeling of being worthless 
and being high, not being worthy of love. Shame says to us, you don't belong. Mm -hmm. But now that the God of all grace has himself established and strengthened and restored you, you are no longer a part of this world soaked in the sand of shame. Lord have mercy. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life I now live in the body. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are new creations. Old Patty has passed away and all things are becoming new. The, the life of shame, he says, is no longer a part of you. Locust years, locust years can plunge you so far down that it can be difficult to look up. But the Bible says never again Will my people, my people, who are my people? My people are the ones who repent and turn from their wicked ways. If my people who are called by my name, uh -huh, my people will never be ashamed. Restored people are his people. God's people, who are these people? God's people are divinely called people. They, they were called out people. They've been called by his name. They've been called out of the bondage of sin. My people, who are these people? They are called out people. They've been, they've been, they were called in people, called into the glorious liberty and light of the children of God, afforded freedom and afforded fellowship. Uh-huh. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. He's called them in to a freedom. Who are God's people? Called out ones, called in people, and they're called out. They're called out one day to ever be with the Lord. God's people are a cleansed people. They've been cleansed. They, Jesus told Peter in 3, John 13 and 10, he said, you are clean. You are clean. We've been cleansed. We've been cleansed from something. Sin. Uh-huh. The Bible says, praise the Lord. Where sin abounded, grace did abound much more. Yes. We've been, we've been cleansed, saints of God, cleansed from something and, and now cleansed with something. This I'm talking about dignified people. We don't have to think like we used to think. We don't have to look like we used to look. We don't have to hold our heads down like we used to look. We can lift up our heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up for the king of glory has come in. There's an unchanging dignity. Nothing ought to affect it. You've been cleansed from something. Sin, you've been cleansed with something. The precious blood of Christ. And you've been cleansed for something. His workmanship. The Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works, watch this, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are called, y'all, to an unchanging dignity. For we have a new identity. These people will never be shamed again. First Peter 2 and 6 says, he who believes on him will be by no means put to shame. We have a new identity, not the shame or the proud, but the blessed and the grateful. Say it again, Bishop. We have a new identity, not the shamed or the proud, but the blessed and the thankful. You're his own special possession, according to 1 Peter 2 and 9. We are loved beyond compare, according to 1 John 4 and 19. You are worth dying for. You, according to 1 John 3 and 16, you are forgiven. Ephesians 1 and 7. You are his child, 1 John 3 and 1. Secured for all eternity, 2 Corinthians 1 and 22. Set free, Romans 6 and 18. Precious to him, Isaiah 43 and 4. Set apart, John 15 and 16. Saints of God, we are, our lives should reflect an unchanging high dignity when nobody else wanted us. God didn't turn his back. When family walked out, friends walked out, God didn't turn his back. And he brought us in, wretches undone, and lifted up our heads and causes us now to walk forthright in the things of God. We are, our lives should reflect an unchanging dignity. When I was growing up, one of the little sayings that people used to say that they thought, that thought they knew you well was, I knew you when. I knew you when. And Bishop, after I got saved, started walking with the Lord and would return to my home and all of that, there were times I would feel some kind of way about being around the folk that knew me when. Till one day somebody told me I was adopted into the family of God. Somebody taught me what it meant to walk with God. Somebody taught me 
what it meant to be loved by God. Somebody taught me what real love is. Somebody taught me uh -huh, what it meant to be restored. Somebody taught me of the new life in Christ Jesus. And then my head began to lift up and it's been lifted up every second. I ain't perfect, but I'm lifted. Come on, somebody. I'm not perfect, but I'm lifted. I'm not the best in the world, but I'm lifted. Come on in here, somebody. I'm not the best teacher. I'm not the best wife. I'm not the best mother, but I've been lifted. Come on, somebody. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise. No more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. Somebody just holler back at me. I ain't perfect, but I'm lifted. Thank you, Jesus. I've been cleansed from something. I've been cleansed with something and for something, and now he calls me his people. Thank you, God. Never again. you both shoe. Never again in the Hebrew, never again, never again will you be ashamed, disappointed, disgraced, or delayed. You will now persevere in the service of the Lord. First Peter 5 says, 5 and 10, and the God of all graces, I get out your way, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered for a little while will make you perfect, will establish you, will strengthen you. Some versions say restore you and settle you. And so I will repay you. <sighs> For the years the locust has eaten, the great locust and the young ones, the other ones in the swarm, my great army that I sent to you, you will have, you're going to have plenty to eat and you're going to be satisfied. And never again will you be ashamed Aha, uh -huh. and you will praise the name of the Lord, your God. And then you're going to know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord, your God, and there is none other. Never again will my people be ashamed. Saints of God, this is a call to obedience. What should life after the locust years look like? They should reflect unrestricted praise should reflect an unending fellowship, should reflect an undivided allegiance, and should reflect unchanging dignity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when I look back at the locust years, look back over my life, I thank God that I've got a testimony. When I look back at where the Lord has brought me from, I get happy in my soul, because truly, saints of God, the Lord has been good. I know it's been a long week. I know you're tired, but I'm inviting you to put those blessed hands together and clap your hands and celebrate God, the God of our restoration. Never again will we have to be ashamed. We don't curse God for what he took us through. We don't curse God for the drought. We don't curse God for the parched land. We don't curse God for the years of barrenness because the songwriter said, I thank God for the mountains. I thank Thank him for the valleys and I thank him for the storms that he's brought me through for if I never had a problem I wouldn't know that God could solve them I would not know what faith in God can do but through it all through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus through it all I've learned to trust in God through it all thank you Jesus it was good that I was afflicted for I learned your statutes. I've learned how to depend upon his word. And I'm grateful today to be labeled one of those who made it a restored generation. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Clap your hands and celebrate God. Bishop McCullough, through it all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I ain't done, but I'm finished. Clap your hands and celebrate God. Thank him, thank him, thank him, thank him. Great is the Lord 
and greatly to be prayed. Come on, he's reviving praise in somebody right now. Somebody that hadn't praised. You think it's weird to praise on Zoom in a little box, but I dare you to get up in your living room, on your patio, your, your lanai, go in your kitchen, wherever you are, clap your hands and celebrate God and declare what the enemy meant for evil. God meant it for my good. Lord, have mercy. Somebody say, you don't know me. You didn't know me 20 years ago, but I promise you, if you look at me now, just take my word for it. Put your hands together and bless God for what he's doing in your neighbor's life, the one in the next box to you, what he's doing in your family's life, your children's life. God is a great restorer. He knows how to do it. Thank you for this thing, Bishop. Woo! Hear my medicine. He knows how to do it. And we're grateful through it all. Back to you, Bishop. Through it all. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Through it all. Come on and worship the Lord. Come on. The preacher gave us a word. We need to worship him right now. Through it all. We're going to ask our praise team to take that song, amen, that the preacher dropped in our spirit. I've had many what? Tears and sorrows. Amen. We know we know that song. Let's sing it. And we're going to worship the Lord while we sing the song. She gave us a, a word of hope today. She let us look towards the post-pandemic years with a different set of glasses. Amen. And everything that we're going through, many of us, the big thing she kept talking about today was shame. Many of us cannot get past the battle of shame. Suppose somebody found out. So suppose somebody saw. Suppose I meet somebody that met somebody that knows something, that knows something, and we live with our head hung down. But today the Lord freed us from what? Shame. Because it was all to bring us to a place where we can raise our hands and worship the Lord. Come on. You have the dignity of the Holy Ghost living inside of you. Amen. That brought you this far. Remember what she said. I am not perfect, but I'm lifted. Come on. I'm not perfect, but I'm lifted. Lifted out of. Lifted out of this. Lifted out of that. Lifted. And the lifting doesn't stop. He keeps on lifting. So come on and worship the Lord right now as the praise team gets ready to sing through it all. And while they sing, let's worship the Lord. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There's been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Come on and raise your hand. Through it all, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through To depend upon his word. I thank God for the mountains. And I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. Oh, for if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Whoa, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all. Got to go through it all. 
I've learned to depend upon his word. Amen, amen. If you really bought into the word today, you would know that this post-pandemic is setting you up for unrestricted praise, unending fellowship, undivided allegiance, unchanging dignity. You will know that God has lifted you. You're not perfect, but you're lifted. All of that from this morning, from all week, you should feel strengthened right now. And if you want special prayer after all of this, whether you are out there on social media platform, but you want to embrace this restored life, you're anticipating restoration. You want this restoration not to start after the pandemic, but even in the pandemic, you want to experience this restoration. Just raise your hand wherever you are, wherever you are. And I thought I saw Overseer Terry McMillan on, and I was going to ask him to pray, amen, wherever he is, if he's still on. But we want to thank the Lord for this powerful, powerful, powerful message that we are not left unfinished. Amen. God is still working in our lives. As Pastor Cleve used to preach, we are a work in progress. So just raise your hand. I don't know where Pastor uh, Overseer Terry McMillan is, if he's still there. Amen. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Yes, please just pray for those who have received the message, and we're going to apply the message. Amen. So let's yes, raise your hand. Go ahead and pray, sir. Yes, ma'am. Father God, we thank you today. God, we are so blessed to be in your presence. God, we thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We are so we are we are so grateful to call you God, and we are your children. God, we thank you right now for our 20 year anniversary of, of the Beth Rafa family. We thank you for Bishop McCullough, how she stands tall and stands in the in the trenches for the word. She stands in the trenches for her people. And she st stands in the trenches for the, for the world. God, she is a blessing to us all. God, we thank you right now as we gather today and, and we call it all joy. Through it all, God, you have blessed us. Through it all, God, you have given us another chance. Through it all, God, you know where we need to be. Even during this time of this pandemic season, God, we know you, you, you say go to all nations, God. You made it a way. You made it a way for right now for us to be in Tampa, Florida, for some folk to be in Cincinnati and some folk to be all over the country and still be a part of the Beth Rafa family today. For so for that, God, we say thank you. We thank you right now for the word that Bishop McMillan brought upon us today. We thank you that, that she will be uh, fully re-strengthened and go where God has, has her to be, that he will strengthen her today and she will not, not lose anything from what she have put out today. God, we believe in what you're saying. We cannot change anything, God, it's on all you. We cannot do what we want to do, God, in good graces of your sight. So we are blessed to be among you today. We are blessed to be among the people today. We thank God for this fellowship. We thank you for the new clergy that was ordained yesterday. We thank you for still there are ways, to God, that you are making it stronger for all of us. So we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Amen. And you're released with this word. Amen. We are in, we are already getting a post pandemic mindset. Some of us can get stuck and be so stuck with what we see, but God is preparing us of how we're going to make the shift out of this particular pandemic. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have other problems. It doesn't mean that situations is just going to be perfect all the way around forever. But it just means that whatever God is going to do for us, we are ready to embrace it. We are ready to embrace the grace and the word of God. So just raise your hand one more time and thank God that he has given us this wonderful word. And we pray God's strength and we pray God's anointing upon Bishop and upon New Dawn, that whatever she gave out today, it would also return to their fellowship and their ministry a hundredfold. So put your hands together one more time and may the Lord bless and keep all of you for joining 
Amen. And thank you, those of you out there on social media. You have celebrated with us 20 years, and we're so grateful. We may not be able to see you, but we feel you. We feel the love. Many of you are in the chat, but so many of you did not get in the chat, but it doesn't mean that you weren't praying for us. And we pray that everything that was said and done and enriched your life pushed you closer to a, a deeper relationship with the Lord and any questions you had that they were answered and any confusion you had were cleared up and any stumbling blocks you had got out of the way and any discouragement that you had that the Lord lifted your spirit. May you walk in the freedom of the word of God and God bless you. We'll be back here at 6.30 and we have some special treats for you at the 6.30 service. So many different presentations that I think will just make this week just what it should be. It will just bring it to that culminating point in Jesus name. And remember, after the, re after the pandemic, there is obedience. God bless you. On behalf of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough and the Beth Rafa family, thank you for joining our live stream service. Visit us online at BethRafa.org where you can submit your prayer requests, give into the work of the ministry, and connect with our church family via social media. God bless you richly, and we look forward to you joining us again.